Hello, I am uh, Raja Raman. I am a theoretical physicist at JNU. Uh, today, I'll be telling you something about climate change, a phrase which has become very popular in the last 20 years. Uh, it has become also politically very important with national leaders discussing it at various places. And people are really beginning to get concerned about what it is, how much of it is true, and how much of it is just panic. So is this climate change news real, or is it just speculation? It depends on which aspect of climate change you're talking. Are you talking about rapid carbon emissions? Are you talking about the importance of carbon emissions and the effect it has on temperature? Are you talking about the temperature, whether it's actually rising or not? And then various aspects about the impact of global temperature rising. What does it do? Uh, so many of these things are verified experimentally. You can see it in your instruments. And some others are speculative in the sense that they are things which you're talking about for the future, which at the moment you can only predict using computer calculations or using your models. So one of my jobs is to begin from the beginning, take each one of these stages, and point out which is real and which, while not wrong, is still to be confirmed. So uh, let me start with uh, carbon emissions. So we all know what this carbon emission problem is. We've seen greenhouses. We've had them in many gardens of homes. We've had greenhouses in parks. We've had greenhouses in biology labs. If you go near them, it's basically a building with glass walls. Inside that, you keep plants which badly need sunlight. So that's the purpose of the greenhouse. And what happens is, that sunlight comes in from outside, passes easily through the glass, because glass is transparent, heats up the plants. When the plants get hot, they want to give back the heat. But they are giving it now at a different wavelength of light, which doesn't penetrate the glass so easily. So the glass is able to let in light, but it's not able to let out heat waves. So the heat sort of stays in. And the plants, even in winter time, in very cold weather outside, can be at much warmer temperatures inside. This is what a greenhouse is. It's meant for bringing up greens. And the main point in the greenhouse is that there's one-way transmission. The light from the outside comes in, but the heat from the inside is not able to go out because it's at a different wavelength, different frequency. Now, same thing happens for the greenhouse effect on the Earth. We have the Earth. Surrounding that, we have the atmosphere, which is rather like the glass walls of the greenhouse. There's the sun giving us light, which penetrates and comes towards the Earth. It passes right through the atmosphere, comes to the Earth, heats it up. The Earth then wants to give it back in the form of heat waves, but those are not transmitted that easily by the atmosphere. And the culprit in the atmosphere that prevents this is primarily carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide does not let heat go through it easily. It absorbs it and reheats back the Earth. So what has been happening since the creation of the Earth or sometime thereafter is that the sun gives you heat, the light, the heat, earth gets warmed up, sends out the heat, but some of that heat keeps coming back. Net result is there is a certain kind of equilibrium which keeps the earth happy at a temperature of about 59 degrees globally. This has been going on for eons. And the main reason why this happens is because of the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, which is preventing the heat from going out. Otherwise, we would all it will become cold. In planets which don't have the atmosphere, the reason the temperature is so little is because there's nothing to hold the heat in. Now, this was fine. The Earth was at a comfortable temperature of 59 degrees average. Then come, came industrialization. And with industrialization, carbon dioxide was emitted. Methane was emitted. These are gases which are like the glass in the greenhouse. They tend to keep in the heat. So, there was some level of carbon dioxide always being emitted in nature. Trees absorb it, people emit it, animals emit it, burning of coal or wood emits it. But there was an equilibrium whereby what is emitted and what is absorbed roughly cancel each other, and the Earth had a roughly steady temperature of around 60 degrees. Now, since the past one century, or largely the last 70 years, the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has grown up enormously because of industrialization, because of transportation, and because of energy production. We burn coal 
to create electricity. All these are carbon dioxide emitters. So the amount of carbon dioxide in the air has gone up. This is not just a matter of pollution of the air like we talk about in Delhi. It's not that it's bad for us to breathe. That may be true too. But here the problem is that this carbon dioxide also prevents heat from getting out, which means that the earth is going to get hotter. This phenomenon is not just speculation. It's not just done said in analogy with what happens in a greenhouse in your garden. It actually has been measured. So very careful measurements show uh, that after about 19, 1900 or so, there has been a very rapid increase which became even more steep after 1950 and is going exponentially upwards. This again is a fact. You can measure the temperature of the earth by any number of devices, average them, check out with everybody else who is measuring it, and the numbers are finally distilled out. And this is an experimental or real fact of the world. So this is not speculation. Now, uh, I should mention that carbon dioxide is primarily coming from uh, coal burning. It also comes from transportation. There is also methane, which is coming from agriculture, again from industries. All these are together forming what is called greenhouse gases, the gases which keep the heat in. And it is these which have gone up over the passage of the last 40, 50 years. So what it has done, <clears throat> for, so it's a fact that these gases have increased hugely in the atmosphere in the last 50, 60 years. Now, from the greenhouse analogy, we know that it's going to heat up the earth. But the real question is how much? If it heats it up a small amount, okay, we don't have to worry about it. So this is where you have to measure temperatures. Now, that is also being measured. In fact, long before all this happened in 1896 or something, very bright physicist as always, uh, Arrhenius, who predicted that this carbon dioxide, if it's allowed to grow like this, the earth's temperature will go up by 5 or 6 degrees centigrade. He said this 100 years ago. No computers, nothing, just paper and pencil. Subsequently, we have all these devices. We have computational power of incredible amount. We have measuring devices which are very accurate. And measurements have been made. And indeed, the Earth's temperature is going up. It's gone up already by about slowly going up. It was 0.8 degrees above the average about five, six years ago. It's now one degree above the average around last year. First thing you have to have to explain is why should we worry about something which is one degree? Because between morning and night, there is a difference in temperature of 15 degrees. Between India and uh, in the summer and uh, you know, uh, Russia in the winter, the temperature is 30 degrees, 40 degrees difference. We live through all that. We survive from morning to night to back to the next morning where temperature differences are so much, it doesn't seem to bother us. That is true. All these ups and downs of temperature human beings and animals have learned to live with. And when, after the heat goes, the winter comes, after winter goes, summer comes, the average is something that creatures have adapted themselves to on the world. So that is not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about an average increase in the average of the temperature. If you were to go to 19th century, 18th century, 17th century, and so on, summers and winters were there even then. But the average temperature was flat. The last 50 years, the average temperature has gone up to almost a degree above what it used to be in the pre-industrial period. So we are not talking about day-to-day -day variation, we're talking about the average. Why should even this worry us? All right, so the average temperature has gone up by one degree. So maybe Delhi's maximum instead of being 46 will become 47, or minimum will become 13 instead of 12. So why should that be cause of so much concern? The point is that when the world temperature on the average goes up by one degree, in some places it goes up by quite a bit, in some places not so much. In particular, the Arctic temperatures go up by as much as 5 or 6 degrees when there's a 1 degree increase in the average temperature. Now, if the Arctic temperature goes up by 6 degrees, the ice begins to melt. This is just speculation, if you like. But now you can go and look at the Arctic Ocean, and you find large chunks of land is visible where there used to be nothing but ice before. So the question is, why does an increase by something so small as 1 or 2 degrees become so important, leading to so much discussion and controversy between countries. That's because even a small increase, like a one degree increase, globally on the average, does lead to fluctuations where some places is more than that, some places is less. In particular, in the Arctics, the temperature goes up by four to five degrees, sometimes even six deep in Russia, when the global average is one degree. 
Even five and six degrees may not seem to you like much, but when you're five degrees hotter, you melt more ice than you would have normally, and you don't freeze as much ice in the summer, winter, as you would have normally. And so the differential between what happens in melting and what happens during refreezing, all of them are going in favor of the ice melting a little bit more every year. So even though six degrees is not very much, six degrees of extra melting year after year after year can deplete the ice covering the uh, mountains, the high parts, and the Arctic and the Antarctic. And this is no longer not speculation, because you now have all kinds of pictures available all over the, the, uh, the web showing you uh, big glaciers showing enormous difference between last year and this year. In fact, just last year, a piece of ice broke off from Antarctica. That piece of ice was the size of the state of Sikkim. The whole chunk just broke off. Uh, the Americans tell you it's the size of uh, New Hampshire, but I don't want to say that. What's New Hampshire to us? The size of Sikkim. Huh? I had to hunt around to find a state. As say. So these are really happening. There are photographs of this. That piece that broke off from Antarctica is there. You can go and see it. Therefore, the effects of this one degree increase are clearly visible. Uh, what is not, furthermore, another problem happens here. This thing feeds into itself and makes it worse. Ice reflects light better than water does. Water tends to absorb light, the heat. Light, ice tends to reflect it. When you reduce the amount of ice vis-a-vis -vis water, then the reflective part is getting less, the absorptive part is becoming more, and therefore the warming gets worse. Some of the light which heat which would have gone into the atmosphere and through that into space is now still being retained. So not only is ice melting, the melting of ice makes the process go faster. So this is one of the bad consequences of uh, the glacier melting, apart from the fact that the beautiful glaciers are melting. Then, because the glaciers are melting and turning into water, slowly the water level will go up. This has also first speculated, but now it's been measured. So it is believed that already a couple of years ago, the sea level on the average, once again, this is the average. There are the tidal periods and the non-tidal periods when the height goes up and down, but this is the average. There has been a roughly two and a half inch increase in the global sea level uh, since at 2014, since the time of the pre-industrial period. So, and typically, in, the calculation is about an eighth of an inch you will go up every year. So that's calculation. Leave that aside. But the increase up till now by two and a half inches has happened. So that again is a fact. And furthermore, some of these increases have been calculated theoretically. And whatever they have calculated tends to agree with what has been observed. So that the guys who do the theorizing, guys who do the modeling, are not way off. Therefore, one can put some weight on what they're predicting about the future also. So in the future, depending on whose prediction you believe, sea level can go up by a couple of feet, can even go up by a meter. And some guys say 10 meters, but that may be on this crazy end. But even a couple of meters is bad enough. So for especially some low-lying portions of the Earth, take the Maldives Islands, which are in the news lately. They are just a few feet above the sea. And just a little bit of increase in sea, the entire Maldives islands will go under. It's not just Maldives, Bangladesh. The coast of Bangladesh, in particular the beautiful Sundarbans, will go under water if there's a one meter increase in the sea level. This, as to when that one meter will happen, will it happen in 20 years, 50 years, 100 years, could be argued about, because that's based on speculative calculations. But that it is going up, the sea level, that is true. And how much it will take to go make Sundarbans go under is also clear. Only thing which is not clear is, will this happen? How much time will it take to happen? And before it happens, can we take steps so that prevent further expansion of the same phenomenon? So this is, that is how it stands with respect to sea levels rising. Then there are other consequences. Well, I had, the thing I had shown a picture of uh, a Statue of Liberty with about water coming up to here. That won't happen. That's just a, that's just a picture. But uh, certainly the uh, prospect of Bangladesh, parts of it, several million people being displaced is very real, maybe 50 years from now. And where are they going to go? They're going to come to India, as they've done. So even if India is not directly threatened by climate change right now, it has to worry about the problem because the indirect effects will come and hit you much faster than you think. One of the things about climate change is that 
whatever you do to make climate change worse from your country affects not only you but everybody because it's a global phenomenon. The carbon mixes up everywhere, the temperature goes up everywhere on the average. So whatever good you do to mitigate it doesn't help only you but helps the entire place. By converse of the same law, whatever damage you do doesn't hurt you directly but hurts everybody else. So if your neighbor is piling up carbon into the air, it's going to affect you and everybody else also. So these are measures, therefore, that have to be taken globally, and countries of the world have to uh, cooperate on this. Now, for a long time, governments in the world did not take climate rise seriously. People have been worrying about it, scientists, for 50, 60 years. And this was dismissed more or less as a fevered imagination of scientists. You know, They say these wild uh, science fiction type of things. But gradually, as these measurements were made, governments have come around to taking it seriously. And many steps have been taken. The International Panel on Climate Change, of which you all heard, which got the Nobel Prize, was formed in 1988. And there was a UN conference on climate change, which has, there was a UN convention, framework convention on climate change, again, about 25 years ago. And little by little since then, more and more conferences have been convened by leaders, topmost leaders of the world, trying to do something about the climate change problem. Uh, we saw this picture of uh, uh, Dr. Manmohan Singh and Obama sitting with shirt sleeves in the same room in Copenhagen. So they were serious about it. But the negotiations are clouded by a certain amount of conflict of the following kind. The countries that have emitted most of the carbon so far are the industrialized countries. They did it in the last 100 years. Now they want us who are just on the cusp of doing that internalization ourselves to not emit carbon. So this is considered unfair. Somebody starts the problem, somebody else is expected to help solve it. So this creates a certain amount of uh, this harmony in the universal attempt to do something about climate change. The developing country says, look to the developed one, you guys started this, you do something. The developed country says, we can't do anything, you are the one who's currently emitting more carbon, so you do something. So some financial compromise was made in Paris whereby the rich countries offered to pay a certain number of billions of dollars to the developing countries so that they would undertake these measures. And the most successful conference was the one in Paris. And the main agreement in Paris was that it will take, it will ensure, it will strive to keep the increasing temperature to below two degrees. So right now it's one degree. By the end of the century or ever, they want to keep it below two degrees and will further pursue efforts, their language, to keep it as close to 1.5 as possible. These are the intentions, part of the resolution of the Paris summit. Sounds very good. That's only three years ago, 2015. But the measures that have been suggested by the Paris summit for countries to follow voluntarily, there is no force in this, those measures, even if put into effect 100%, will still lead to a three degree increase. That's the prediction. So they, even after putting into action all the measures that every country has promised, you still would not have done enough. You would have to completely cut down carbon emission after that rather drastically to make sure it doesn't go above two degrees by the end of the century. So there's a huge, huge task ahead of the world in this, and uh, different countries have responded differently. India has certainly been, has responded very positively in the Paris conference. It has agreed to cut down its emission, gross domestic emission, at 33% per capita and compared to 2005 levels. And for this, it says we will replace carbon emitting sources of electricity by nuclear, by wind, and by solar. It is promised to increase nuclear all the way up to 63 gigawatts by 2032, increase also solar by 100 gigawatts by that time. So these have all been announced. The efforts are going on. With nuclear, I don't think they will reach. It's a very ambitious scheme. It's unlikely to function, but wind, they might. And so with these measures, India would have met the Paris commitments. As I said, the Paris commitments themselves will still leave you 30, 40, 50 years for your children and your grandchildren with a situation where the climate change is still going on. So we have to wait and see what happens to the world. It is certainly an existentialist threat of the same level as nuclear weapons were an existentialist threat. One will get rid of you in a matter of minutes. The other may take months, years, and centuries to do it, but will do it nevertheless unless you take some steps now to counter it. Thank you.